All right, all right. Well, you can take a seat. And I would love to just kind of start with a declaration. So if you'd pray with me, and I would love if you'd pray these words after me. Lord Jesus, I offer myself this morning to listen to what you have for me, to be led by your spirit, and to say yes to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. I think sometimes it's good for us to kind of put our words out in front of us to remind ourselves of why we're here, that we don't show up to simply hear words of a man, but we show up to hear the words of God. And so uh, as we were kind of taking this idea for the next sermon series, this idea came to my mind about culture. And so I grew up in northern Maine, about 15 minutes away from the Canadian border, and there were some things growing up that I thought everybody participated in. I thought everybody did these things in high school. And so there are a couple of things I was thinking, reflecting back on my time in high school, that I think maybe were a little bit different than maybe your time in high school. And so how many of us had prom? Okay, show of hands. All right, so most of us had prom. Okay, so one of the things, and maybe y'all did something like this too, but in northern Maine, one of the things that was like the main show was that people would line up on the streets and all of the high school kids would show the craziest vehicles that they could show up to prom in. So you had these girls decked out, just like straight up, did their makeup, like dresses, just sitting on a tractor, just like, what's up? You know, like they would just be, you know, sit on, some guy like drew up in a combine, like no joke, limos were out, like that wasn't even cool at all. And so it'd be this crazy parade of all of these different vehicles showing up to our high school. I thought that was normal. Maybe, maybe some of y'all are like, yeah, Midwest, it's just totally normal. But for me, I was like, man, I found out later, maybe that wasn't so normal. We had something in high school called the Senior Fashion Show. So literally what you would do is there was this local place in town that would donate suits and dresses, and parents would come and pay to see their kid dressed up and walk across the stage with a girl that was dressed up. So like literally like you just like show up and you're like walk up, like smile for the camera and then you'd walk off. And like it was, that was our senior fashion show. Uh, the last thing, and maybe y'all can relate to this being from the Midwest, but we had something where we would go to school three weeks early as high schoolers. And so we would show up three weeks early because after those three weeks, we would have three weeks of potato harvest. And so literally, like, you'd get out of school, all the high schoolers would get out of school to go pick potatoes. And so whether it was by hand or if it was on a big machine, whatever that looked like, we had potato harvest. I don't know, anybody, like, any of those things, like, relate to anybody here? Or is that totally just, okay, yeah. So that's culturally 100% northern Maine. When I think of Wisconsin, I think cowboy boots, even though y'all don't got... A, like a, a horse or anything. You just got like cowboy boots on. I think of like boot cut jeans, you know, like still still in fashion here in the Midwest. I think during every wedding, like having the thing written like Mr. and Mrs. on their shoes, like that's what I think of when I think of the Midwest. But all those things are things that are cultural. And when it comes to culture, I think sometimes we don't recognize the culture around us because we're participating in it. And so when we talk about this sermon series, we're calling it Ecclesiology. Somebody say Ecclesiology. ecclesiology. Some of y'all, you're like tongue twister. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. It's the study of the doctrine of the church. And so maybe you're familiar with maybe the polity of the church or the structuring of the church. But as we think about the church, the question that I ask myself is this. If someone were to encounter our church, and if our church were a person... What kind of characteristics would that person have? Would they have short hair? Would they have no hair? No, I'm just kidding. That's not, not, not at all. Right? What are the kind of things? Would they feel like this is a place that is hospitable? Would they feel like it's a place that's unified? Would they feel like it's a place that they could show up and there would be grace? It's those sorts of characteristics and traits that make up the culture of any place. You see, whenever more than one person shows up, that place is a culture. Do you know that in your marriage, your marriage is a culture? That the way that you communicate with one another, the way that you fight with one another, the way that you show up and the, the dishes that you leave on the counter, or maybe in your house there are no dishes on the counter, the way that you interact on a regular basis, that's the culture of your marriage. 
In your family, there's culture to your family. The idea of how do you interact with one another? Are you the kind of family that everybody comes together for dinner? Or are you the kind of family that everybody goes to their separate rooms and you don't even know, like, I, I think that I still, they're in the house maybe, but I'm not really sure. What's the culture of your family? And so the idea behind the sermon series is what if every one of us in every place that we went brought kingdom culture? What if in every room that we went into, if every workplace that we entered into, if every conversation that we had, we brought this kingdom culture? And what if our church as a whole had certain characteristics that defined it so that people, when they encounter somebody from Movement Church, they know what Movement Church is all about? You see, even culturally speaking, I think many of us, when we think about the church, we think about a building. We think, well, listen, what church do you go to? What building do you go to? When in reality, all around the world, some of the fastest growing movements is, has nothing to do with the building. But some of the fastest growing churches have everything to do with these bodies of believer, less than 20 people most of the time, meeting in people's homes. And so they multiply out. So now you're meeting in your home, and now you're meeting in your home. And it's these movements sweeping across different places around the world. You see, the church is not a building. The church is the people of God. And the way that we view the church has to say a lot about the culture around us. And so the reason I think this is really important is because, and I wrote this down in my own notes, and by the way, there are no slides this morning. So you're on your own to write your own notes, to find your own Bible, and we're not going to be carrying you across the finish line anymore. And so uh, go ahead and write this down. Some of y'all are like, shoot, like you're writing down on your arm. That's cool. That's fine. And so I wrote this down. I think the reason this is important is because if we don't allow Scripture to shape the culture of the church, then America will shape the culture of the church. Then political beliefs will shape the culture of the church. Then the media will shape the culture of the church. You see, I think this is a crazy idea. How many weeks are there in a year? 52. Okay, so if you came to church every single weekend, which I know some of y'all don't, if you come to church every single weekend, let's say that you did, how many hours a year do you spend in church? 52. Okay, so let's say for the, you know, average person around, like let's say if they show up three times a month, and so if they show up three times a month, how many hours are you at church? <laughs> we got some, some math. Okay, so there's 12 months, and so 52 minus 12 is Oh my, 40, that's 40 for sure. Yeah, you nailed it. So, okay, so let's say hypothetically that you spend 40 hours a year in church. They just came out with a statistic that said that an average social media user spends 1,300 hours on social media. That's 25 times the amount of time that you'll spend in church. Not only that, but they found that those who play video games, listen to talk show radio, watch TV, are on their computer listening to podcasts, that on average we listen to or consume seven hours of media every single day. Right? Some of us are feeling guilty. We're looking at our phone with a little like average time spent. We're like, gosh, that's a lot. Seven out. That means in the course of a week, you will be more influenced by the media around you than what you will be influenced by the church in an entire year. And I think that what happens, we start to wonder, why does the church look so much like everybody else? Why is it that when you step into the church, that oftentimes it seems like there's like the other and so the other would be somebody who doesn't believe the way that you believe. And so we step into a church, and all of a sudden, there's somebody else who's other than us. And we say, well, listen, you know, those are the people that vote that way. Those are the people that believe those things. Those are the people, and we begin to have this divide in the church because we don't see the reality of how God has called us to be in community with one another. And what happens is we spend so much time listening to a media that is trying to divide that we forget that the church is here to unite. You see, the way that media makes money is through you, that you are the product and the longer that they can get you scrolling through social media, afraid of the world around you, the more time that you spend on their platform, they're seeing dollar signs. And one of the best ways they make that possible is through making you angry. 
And so what happens, but I scroll through social media and I see people who are super angry. I see people who are super upset because there's an other out there that we don't know that we're mad at. And what happens is sometimes we don't come to church. We don't get around somebody who's different than us that we need to learn to love. And so what happens, we don't hear those voices anymore of people who know Jesus, who think differently than we do, speaking into our lives. And so the idea behind this sermon series is this question, what does it look like for us to be a people who have healthy culture? A culture that actually models the Bible, that as we think about our marriage culture, as we think about our family culture, as we think about our workplace culture and our church culture, what would it look like if every place that we stepped into, we brought culture from the kingdom of God? And so I want to give you this idea. It's just a very simple diagram, but uh, here's the idea. It's that every culture is formed of individuals. And those individuals form a culture. But then what's interesting is then that culture forms those individuals. Because what you'll notice is that if you don't participate in that culture, then it will either reject you or you will try to change the individuals in it. And so what that means is every church body has a culture that what you'll find is that the people who stay are the people who fit into this culture. They're the people that fit into this kind of body of believers. And the people who don't stay are the people that maybe don't fit into the culture. And so the question is, what does it look like for us as individuals to shape a church culture in such a way that it is full of what Jesus invites us into? It's full of compassion. It's full of love. It's full of grace. It's full of unity and holiness. What does it look like for us as individuals to shape the culture of a church that then shapes us as individuals? So that when we show up, when we interact with one another, I know I need you. Because you show a side of God that I don't understand, that some of y'all have spiritual gifts that, are, that our body needs, that some of you have fruit of the Spirit that are joy and peace, and what we need is for you to bring that in. Some of y'all love justice, and so you want to go out and you want to make changes in the community, and we all need one another so that we as individuals are formed to look more like Jesus because we are a part of the collective. And so throughout this series, what we want to do is we want kingdom culture that results in personal Christ-likeness. That the heart is that during our time together that we would be able to see what it looks like to be followers of Jesus in a greater way, which shapes and molds us as individuals, which changes our community to be able to show the love and grace of Jesus. If I can be honest, there are a lot of churches and pastors out there that are forming counterculturers to the kingdom of God. I was watching a pastor the other day that was growing his congregation by dividing them against everybody else in the United States. And so what happens is we end up kind of coming to these pastors and these pastors are dividing people and they're trying to gain people into their congregation by dividing people in the United States. And I would say, listen, that's not okay. That's wrong. For us to listen to pastors who are dividing is wrong. I watch as pastors, there are groups of pastors who say, well, listen, I'm not touching cultural ideas with a 10-foot pole. Like, you can't, and not a chance, like, I'm not talking about all that kind of stuff. I'm not touching it. I'm not talking about it. Because I know as soon as I talk about it, people are going to blow up. Y'all are going to leave the church. And these people are going to be mad at me. These people are going to be happy. These people are going to leave. These people are going to stay. I think that's wrong. I think pastors who talk about nothing but politics is wrong. So for us, I think I've seen pastors, uh, as I've talked to some pastors, they are going through burnout, struggle, hardship, because they're wondering how do we address hard topics of culture and how do we come through on the other side looking more like Jesus? So is it okay if we talk about some hard topics? Is it okay if we talk about some things that I, I just dance all over your toes and I make everybody mad? That's my decision. As a pastor, I just decided, like, I hope all of you leave mad. I hope, like, there's no group of people that are like, man, I really feel like he, like, he was right on board with me. No, I want you to leave being like, oh, that really, like, man, was that really what's up? Yeah, 100%. Because me, my call as a pastor is to call out things in our culture so that we look more like Jesus and less like us. And so coming to our passage today, that's exactly what Jesus did. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 11. 
And uh, it's an interesting passage today. If you want to pull that up on your phones or in your Bibles to make sure that this is actually, I'm reading what's up. And uh, the CSB version today, here's what happens. It says, the next day, when they went out from Bethany, he was hungry. And so you have the 12 disciples, they're following Jesus, and Jesus is hungry. Seen in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. And everybody said, amen. I understand what's happening in that passage right now. So Jesus shows up. He's hungry. There's a fig tree. It looks like it should be a fig tree that's mature enough to begin to bear fruit. But as he goes up to it, there's no fruit on the fig tree. And so you'd think there's an end to the story. But then all of a sudden, the writer, Mark, does something really interesting where he goes into a different narrative in verse 15. So, and the disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem and went out into the temple. And he began to throw out those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves and would not permit anyone to carry goods to the temple. He was teaching them, is it not written my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the scribes heard it. And started looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. When evening came, they would go out of the city. So Jesus shows up in town, comes to the local church, and instead of showing up to the local church, being a good church person, he starts to overturn all the tables. He kicks over the coffee maker, right? All the donuts, he kind of like throws them like frisbees at you. He's like, are you kidding me? Right? He kind of kicks over everything. And then just kind of leaves, right? Then all of a sudden, we see the story again in verse 20. Early in the morning, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says this mountain be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes in what he says, it will happen. And it will be done for him. What a weird story. Can we be honest? There's some things that I read in the Bible and I'm like, what is happening right now? Like, I don't, we don't write like that today. But what's happening is actually this, this idea, this literary structure called intercalation. Somebody say intercalation. intercalation. So what that means, you have story A and then there's story B right at the end of story A. But after story B, then he goes back into story A. And you wonder, well, why would somebody do that? And the reason why is because he's inviting you into this question of what is similar about these stories. What are the things that I should be looking for as he's talking about this fig tree and then going into the temple and then all of a sudden a fig tree again? What are the similarities between this? Because it starts out, Jesus sees a fig tree. And the reality is that as we look throughout the Hebrew Bible, that there's a number of times that Israel is actually referred to as a fig tree. And so you see the people of Israel are referred to as a fig tree. It looks like it should bear fruit. It looks the part. It looks good. But as Jesus goes up to it, what he finds is there's no fruit on it. That even though it wasn't the season for figs, that it was at the beginning of the season. So he should have seen some sort of growth. But what he sees is nothing. So he goes into the temple The place where it should be that people are worshiping God, where it should be that there is a good and holy and pure culture, where it should be that the nation of Israel is blessed to be a blessing. But instead, what he sees is actually these people selling things for profit in the temple. He sees people are using the temple as a shortcut to get to where they're going. And so what he does is he casts them out. And then he comes back to the fig tree. And what do you see? But he cursed it and it withered from the roots up. And the question is this. The question is, where should we see fruit? That we're not seeing fruit. That since we don't see fruit, Jesus is saying, I'm not there. Because I think sometimes what happens in church culture is that it looks the part. We show up and we're like, man, I got like, I did my hair. 
I look good. I put my makeup on. You know, I, I, I did, got a little pump before I came out and so I'm feeling good. You know, like we hang out and after service, you know, we're all like, you know, we have a little, a little potluck outside and it looks really good. But the Lord is saying, listen, it can look good. But just because it looks good doesn't mean there's fruit. And so I think what this passage is inviting us into as a church is to say, listen, what does it look like for the church to reconsider its DNA, to reconsider being salt and light to the earth, that people would wonder and look to the church and say, how could it be that those people can get along and love the world around them in that way? That's the fruit of the church. And so I think before we head into this series, I think there are two things that every single one of us needs if we want to be those kind of people. That if we want to be the kind of people that just don't simply like show up culturally to church, but if we want to be changed and transformed so that we actually make a difference and be disciples of Jesus like he calls us to be, there are two things that we need to incorporate into our lives that come from the passage. The first thing we need to incorporate into our lives is that every healthy culture has mirrors. Every healthy culture has what? Mirrors. I know that you're like, what in the world? Uh, but here's what's up. So, Abby, I would love for you. Can you just go ahead and can you grab this mirror? I took this off my wall earlier today. And can you hold it up for, uh, for Trisha here for a second? Can you just can you hold it up? What do you see in the mirror? Just what do you see? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you come over to Chase? Chase, uh, let's go ahead and bring the mirror to Chase. Chase, what do you see in the mirror? Okay, okay, good, good, good. All right, Lacey over here. One more time. Let's go to Lacey. What does Lacey see in the mirror? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. You can set that down. So here's the thing. A mirror shows you an accurate picture of who you really are. A mirror, when you look into it, shows you all of the things that maybe you see that you don't wanna see and all the things that you see that you want to see. And that's exactly what we see as Jesus steps into the, ta into the temple, what does he do? But he shows people who they really are. And he shows up and he says, this is what scripture says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so what Jesus does is he shows and he holds up this mirror to say, do you see the difference? Here's what scripture says you're called to be and here's how you're actually living. And when you hold up a mirror to someone, it shows the discrepancies between the two so we can actually judge ourselves rightly. Here's what James says in chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Here's what this means. It means that if we want to be changed and transformed, we need to look into the mirror of scripture to look at what scripture calls us to do and then look at our lives and ask ourselves the question, do I see any discrepancies? So for example, let's just kind of go to an easy passage. 1 Corinthians 13. Anybody know what 1 Corinthians 13 talks about? Love, love right? It's the love passage. All right, but I want to draw this home. Okay. So you're scrolling through social media, which everybody knows you're about to get a little upset. And so you're scrolling through social media and all of a sudden you see that post from that person that you're friends with. And you're like, are you, are you kidding me right now? Do you even know, like, you don't even know the science behind all of it. You don't even, like, are you, and all of a sudden you start to rise up in your spirit. You start to get mad and you're thinking, I'm going to show them what's up. I'm going to, I'm going to change their mind by typing on their wall on Facebook. And that's really going to make a difference in their life. That'll really show them who's boss. And so you start going and you're like, and, and this is what the CDC says. And this is what doctors say and this is what everybody else says and all of a sudden we start to get all hyped up and all mad and all angry and what needs to happen in that moment is just very simply i think what the holy spirit does he says oh wait 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 a second he says um first corinthians 13 just a little mirror for you for a second that what i'm seeing in you is maybe not patience what i'm seeing in you is maybe not kindness or gentleness, or self-control. 
What I'm seeing in you in this moment as you look into scripture is I'm seeing rage. I'm seeing hatred. I'm seeing vitriol that you're spewing out of your mouth toward the people around you. And you say that you're a Jesus follower. And what scripture does is it holds up a mirror for us for a moment to pause and to recognize and ask ourselves the question, am I looking right? When our spouse comes up to us and in that moment, you know where it's at, where you can see the two roads and all of a sudden, like they just say, let's go. And they like throw the gloves off and just toss a grenade in the middle of the room. And they're like, well, you remember when you did and you have that moment to just turn around and, and you catch your face in that distorted, like you just wait one sec and you turn around and all of a sudden you see this mirror. God says, man, love keeps no record of wrong. Love doesn't rejoice in what's evil, but rejoices in the truth. And all of a sudden, culture of your heart and your family and your life and the church begins to change because we see ourselves through the mirror of Scripture. And the moment we do that, we see ourselves rightly so that we can understand there's still room for growth. There's still room for me to love somebody who believes differently than me. Then I know what you think about the border and I know what you think about the border and we could talk about wall or no wall. But at the end of the day, I wanna ask the question, how can I love you? Because love keeps no record. Because in the end, all of this is gonna fade away, but three things remain, faith, hope, and love. And what would it look like if the church became a place that we are full of mirrors. That when we come to scripture and we say, man, is this really me? That's what scripture is, a mirror into our soul to say, are you really the kind of person who has grace towards somebody who believes differently than you do? Or are you gonna show up a keyboard ninja and just like ax somebody, you know? Every healthy culture has mirrors. And so we wanna ask ourselves from scripture, am I looking like Jesus as I look in the mirror? Or am I looking like me as I look in the mirror? That's the first thing that we see is that every healthy culture has mirrors. The second thing is this, every healthy culture has windows. Every healthy culture has what? Windows. windows. Okay, what we see in this passage is that actually Jesus is opening up an opportunity as he's confronting the religious people of the day to actually say, listen, Allow me to speak into your life so that you can be changed. Jesus just didn't do that so that they would just like be hard hearted. Jesus did it because he wanted them to see the truth of actually what was. And when we have a window in our life, and so Abby, I'm going to use you again here real quick. So if you want to grab that window. Okay, so Chase, I want you to look at Lexi through the window and tell me what you see. Okay, you see Lexi. Okay, perfect. Trish, I want you to look through the window and look at Jim and tell me what you see. You see Jim. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure we need double confirmation. Thank you. And here's what a window does. A window are the places in our life where we invite people to speak into the way that we're living. Now, the difference between legalism and judgment and a healthy culture where you invite somebody is legalism and judgment is me just looking around with this thing held up all the time being like, oh, ho, 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 ho. let's go. Like, I see you, Mark. Like, I see the things in your life. Let's talk about that. You know, we're like, Arnie, ooh, like, bro, that's really like, let's all, and then I start to see other, and like, Abby, let's go talk about Arnie. And like, we're looking through the window, right? That's judgment. That's what most people experience out of the church is people looking through windows and being like, hey, I see the crap in your life. Like, are you kidding? me. And what Jesus needs us to do in that moment is to hold up the mirror right behind it, right? And then all of a sudden we see ourselves and we're like, hey, that's pretty bad. Uh, but a window, right? A window that we invite people into that is healthy is we say, listen, I want to invite you into a relationship where you can call me out on my stuff. Where you, when you see some stuff that I'm doing and some people I'm interacting with, when you see me with my spouse and, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm starting to pour some stuff out that's not good. I'm allowing you to have a window into my heart and I want you to know that you can speak into my life. Because healthy cultures need windows. 
because you see me differently than I see me. Because maybe I looked in the mirror for a second, but maybe there's something that I missed along the way. And what Jesus invites us into is to say, listen, when Jesus steps into our heart, he invites us into a culture where we have windows and we begin to look into each other's hearts and say, listen, I love you so much that I'm willing to say this in love. I love you so much that I'm not willing to let you continue down the road that you're continuing into. And you invited me. Like, it's not like I just all of a sudden just said, let's, let's go. But no, you like, you invited me into this relationship and conversation that said, help me look more like Jesus. And any healthy culture is an invitation for a window that says, help me see how I can look more like Jesus. That when I have conversations with Holly, there are some times where I look back on the conversation and I say, listen, I really feel like I handled that wrongly and I feel like I could have showed you more empathy. I feel like I could have told you that differently. Help me understand, how could I have done that in a more loving way? Healthy cultures have windows where we open up our lives to the people around us. Because there's an old saying that said, you're only as sick as your secrets. And the open window is an invitation to say, bring light in where there was darkness. Bring goodness in where there was wickedness. Help me look more like Jesus because I want him more than I want anything else. And healthy cultures have mirrors and windows. Jesus shows up and he holds up the mirror of the word. He holds up the mirror of the word and says, listen, the place that you thought you understood, that you were bearing fruit, that's actually the very place where I need to work in your life. Jesus, we see, actually had healthy windows. He was inviting people to say, listen, can I speak into your life in a new way? And what would it look like if we were a group of people who had mirrors and windows? Listen, I know that we're heading into a season that none of us have any idea what's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be masks again, if it's no masks again. We don't know if things are going to close down or open up. Here's my invitation to you. Do not let the world dictate the unity of the church. Man, I'm waiting for somebody to leave their political party for the sake of the church because I've seen a lot of people leave the church for the sake of their political party. And I think what we need to invite each other into is to say, what does it look like to say, these are my people, this is my family, and I'm committed to the people of God. And if I start to get out of line, I'm gonna invite you to say, listen, why don't you start talking to me? And so I have a few challenges for you this week. The first challenge is this. The first challenge is delete social media from your phone this week. I'm not saying doing it for life. I'm not saying, listen, don't ever listen to it again. What I'm saying is this week, delete it. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to all of the junk that people want you to invite you into. And did you hear? And did you say? And did you see? And all of that stuff. And what I want to invite you into is instead of social media, ask yourself, where is my mirror? And maybe wake up in the morning. As when you wake up in the morning, I'm going to invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. And as we read through 1 Corinthians 13 together, you begin to ask the question and say, man, where am I seeing this in my life? As I step into my workplace, is it, this, is it true that love is patient and love is kind? As I'm looking at my marriage, is it true that love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant? Is it true that when I'm with my kids, that love is not rude and not self-seeking, is not irritable, does not keep a record of wrong? As I look in the church, is it true that love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things? Somebody say bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. To be a body of believers that say, listen, I know that there are people different than me, and that's okay. Because I know that love bears all things. And so I want to invite you to the mirror of 1 Corinthians 13 throughout this week, that you would look into Scripture and say, God, would you illuminate to me through the power of the Holy Spirit where these things aren't quite lining up? And the last thing I want to invite you to, so first you're going to delete social media and news feeds from your phone. Then you're going to go to 1 Corinthians 13 and you're going to spend that seven hours a day. And No, just kidding. Uh, but it'd probably be good. We'd look a little bit more like Jesus than we would the world around us, wouldn't we? 1 Corinthians 13 and maybe just start off the day in 1 Corinthians 13. And then I want to invite you to ask yourself the question, who do I trust? 
that I would invite to say, I want to give you a window into my life. This past week, I was in a conversation with somebody, and I was like, listen, I, I've been reading First Timothy with our men's group, and there was Paul, and Paul had Timothy, and I was saying, man, I recognize that I need somebody who's older and wiser to speak into my life. And so I just asked this person, like, hey, listen, would you be willing to speak into my life? And I wonder if there would be anybody who would be willing to say that, who would say, listen, I trust you, I trust your heart, and I want to give you a window into what God's doing in my life. Would you stand with me? So three applications. Delete social media. Lest I don't say that one more time. Delete TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Insta, Snapchat, all that stuff that we spend so much time on. Delete it. Cleanse for a week. Read 1 Corinthians 13 and invite somebody to speak in your life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we long to be a culture that looks so much more like you than we look like ourselves. Man, we want to be raised up so that we actually love the world around us in the way that you've asked us to. And so God, with this community of believers, look not at the external, but look at the internal. Would we not look at all of the things that are happening around us and look just like the people around us, but would you give us the heart to say, man, I'll love somebody who looks different, believes different, thinks different than I do because I believe that the Lord has something to show me. May we make room for you to speak to us through the word and through others this week. In Jesus' name.